computer. Here we go. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Alexis Milligan, um, and welcome to our second uh, Idea Jam hosted by the newly formed. Um, this is a Canadian network for imagination and creativity. Uh, we've been putting this together. There's a group of us that have been gathering for a few months now. And uh, this is our first uh, sort of foray and venture out into trying to get national conversations and discussions uh, going about imagination, creativity, and, uh, and how we can employ them in different areas and avenues and streams of our life and our society. Um, I just want to recognize that I am in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, uh, which is also known as uh, Kujbuktuk or Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Mary Blatherwick, uh, my uh, partner in crime who's co-hosting with me tonight, um, she is also located in Mi'kma'ki and uh, she is up in the valley in Nova Scotia. Um, so these events are being held uh, on the third Thursday of every month. Like I said, this is our second one. Um, and our next one will be in December. I'll give you some more information about that before you head off at the end. We're going till nine o'clock. We do try to give it a good hard nine o'clock stop. So don't worry, I'll give you a 10 and a five minute warning. Um, so everyone is invited to participate and to contribute in any way that you would like. Uh, we do ask that um, I'll be facilitating and watching all the screens. There's a lot of screens to get through. So you can just um, pop up your hand if you wanna say something. Also pop into the chat. Uh, we'll, as I said, we'll be recording those things. I'm gonna try to get to as many people as possible. So just asking for a little bit of patience as we navigate a very new way of communicating. So just in terms of the balance of speaking versus listening, trying to over, um, just try to avoid a bit of overlap. But uh, the other thing is, is that uh, you're also just welcome to sit back and listen. That reflection, daydreaming, um, doodling, anything that might also just be a place for you to receive as, as much as transmit or participate, um, that this is in both worlds. So that we just invite you to, to do either or all of those things. Uh, videos on, videos off. Uh, we do ask that you stay muted until we're able to speak. And our goal for these idea jams is to generate new ideas. Um, to make new connections um, for not only for you on a personal level, but also perhaps within your organizations or the groups of people that you are working with. And we're really hoping to explore together our stories, our ideas, and really our visions for the future um, and how we can move forward with our imaginations and our sense of creative courage. So um, I am just going to briefly introduce myself uh, because I'm sort of co-hosting, I'm moderating uh, the, the events, but just this evening I'm co-hosting with Mary Blatherwick. My background, as I said, I'm in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. I live here with my uh, two children and um, I started in dance, uh, trained in classical theatre, spent the majority of my early career touring with Mermaid Theatre of Nova Scotia, doing puppetry all over the world, and uh, have always been trying to balance my world of dance and theatre and finding out how all the ways that we communicate on various levels. I now found myself um, latched onto, glommed onto Mary Blatherwick. She can't get rid of me no matter how hard she tries. Uh, she is my advisor for my master's, which is in interdisciplinary studies at the University of New Brunswick, and I'm combining arts the performing arts specifically, communications, education, and neuroscience. So that's uh, my focus right now, and I'm going to hand it over to Mary, and uh, she's going to introduce herself and uh, throw down the topic for this evening. Thanks, Mary. Oh, great. Uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you uh, very much, Alexis, for that. Um, and great to see so many people here tonight. It's exciting. As I say, this organization um, has been something... Uh, you know, over the last number of months, we've been working on it, and uh, it really is a um, a way of kind of reaching a national uh, national group of people who are interested in the idea of creativity across disciplines, and uh, not working specifically in the arts, but looking at how creativity affects a number of different areas, um, in all areas, all walks of life. So we were very much uh, uh, interested in that, and 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 including and in involving a lot of different groups from different areas, and not just specifically education, but from all different walks of life and, and different. Uh, 
areas of our, our society. So that's our, that's our goal. And uh, uh, we've been really enjoying the sessions that we have and we've developed a website and so on. So the casual talks are something that uh, we came up with as a, as a way of reaching uh, a national um, group and also to find out what people are interested in and what they'd like to talk about across the, across the country. Um, so a little bit about me. I, well, gosh, I don't know where to begin. <laughs> I've been involved with creativity and, and the arts for a very long time. I've been teaching. Uh, I taught in the schools. Um, I've worked as a supervisor. I've worked as a coordinator. I now teach at the University of New Brunswick um, and I teach at the uh, undergraduate and graduate level uh, courses in um, visual art education, but also in creativity. And uh, I got really excited about creativity a few years ago because of people across the campus were talking about it. Um, but uh, we didn't have any kind of focus. So I thought it'd be really interesting to start a group um, talking about it and uh, people from different walks of life, different areas, different concentrations. And the, um, the whole um, ACC grew out of that, the Atlantic Center of Creativity. Um, and, and from that it's grown into a community organization. A lot of people from different um, uh, organizations across the Atlantic region are a part of it now. Um, and we're, um, we were one of the you know, instigators of the uh, CNIC group as well. So um, we're really excited to have a, a, a broader view. Um, so coming to the topic of this evening, um, we, we were sort of looking at a name for it and it's called challenging the right, uh, the one right answer approach basically. And, um, but before I, before I actually get into talking about it, I'm just going to play with you a little tiny bit. So for instance, um, I have a little plastic cup here tonight. <laughs> One of these things that we, you know, we, uh, we use for a million different reasons, but um, generally speaking, I want to ask two questions about that little cup. One is, number one is, what is a plastic cup? So, um, anyone want to tell me what that is? Annabella has offered a hat in the chat. Before I get to that, what is it, what do we primarily use that for? Anybody? <laughs> Jess has got uh, something to drink with, a right. container drinking. Exactly. Okay, so that just just on that point. So basically, we you know the first question would be, what is that? Okay, I look at that in the store or whatever. It's it's a drinking vessel of some kind. The second question I would ask is, how many uses can you think of for a plastic cup beyond drinking? So suddenly we go from a decision of one thing, okay, that's a plastic cup, it's used for drinking, to what can it be used for? What else can we do with that? What can it be? And so we've switched to a different way of thinking. So what's the kind of, what's, what else could I do with a plastic cup? Anybody? We've got a vase, a spider catcher, a phone. A you phone. could put your pencils in it. A pencil, yeah, put your exactly. pencils in it. Bail out a sinking boat. <laughs> they love the sinking boat. I love it. A couple more good ones. Let's go. What else can we do with this thing? Or to sink a boat. Or to sink a boat. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> a spy tool to listen through a wall. Oh, yes. Very good idea. Yes. A excellent. painting coat. We could use two and make a telephone. A telephone. Yes. I like the telephone idea. It's very good. A microphone. Microphone. Excellent. Art installations. Art installation. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. So goggles. For, or goggles. Oh, yes. Goggles. Make really good glasses. <laughs> yeah. Making protection for the eyes against COVID specifically. <laughs> A terrarium. A terrarium. <laughs> excellent. Excellent ideas. So I just want to talk about that just initially as a kind of to come back to those because there's two different ways of thinking that are happening there that are really part of what this talk is about this evening. So, um, Another title for tonight might be Reimagining Learning in the 21st Century. Um, our education system that we have and we use and has been part of how we, all of us have edu been educated, especially in North America, started really in the 19th century. <clears throat> and the whole idea of it was to create good little workers and uh, to um, conform to certain um, mores and ideas around the industrial era. And of course, to do that, conformity was a big issue. So um, you would emphasize convergent thinking, like what we just did when we said, this is a drinking cup, where we're focusing and we're looking at one solution to that object. The second um, 
interesting thing is that um, creativity, on the other hand, uh, was not motivated because it did not focus on one right answer. It was about something else. Creativity requires critical thinking and divergent thinking, like what you just did when you said this could be a spider catcher or it could be and a telephone. So we start to play with an idea. So that wasn't the idea of that particular focus of schooling. And so learning by rote became the dominant form of educating the masses because it promoted one right answer to every question and every problem. And it was important. It was kind of a, you know, it was, a, and then we all kind of bought into it and it was the way we were taught. And it actually was for many years, the way we were to teach. If you went to a, a training facility and so on, it was about that kind of teaching. Unfortunately, it still goes on to a great degree. We do need conformity. We do need information and things that we learn and we embed in terms of our knowledge, but we also need other ways of learning. We now know that other ways of learning can inspire a range of answers new ideas and innovations. Through the use of imagination and creativity, not just in education, but in all walks of life, new forms of learning are realized. Curiosity is ignited, critical thinking is promoted, problems are solved creatively, new ideas and innovations are explored, all vitally important in the 21st century. We need to ask different kinds of questions to encourage new ways of thinking and encourage diverse answers. So in tonight's session, uh, or today, depending on what part of the, problem, part of the country you are in, um, we invite you to share your thoughts on one, the one right answer approach and how you might reimagine learning in the 21st century. So I open the doors up for people to share their experiences of this, where they've gone with it in their own teaching, uh, the types of things they value as they go forward. So I'm opening that up for comment, any comments or questions? Kathy, not to put you on the spot, um, Kathy Browning has put in the chat uh, the idea of vertical thinking versus lateral thinking. I wonder, Kathy, would you be interested in just elaborating a little bit on that? Oh, and I think you might be muted. Hi. In, uh, in most creative uh, endeavors, whether it be art or any type of music or dance or drama, we tend to think more laterally. We have to think vertically in terms of if, if you have a business as an artist, you have to do a certain amount of vertical thinking. Math requires a um, bit of both, but um, creativity um, tends to involve more lateral thinking processes than, than vertical, um, but you have to be a really good problem solver. And I put in there, who thinks of one right answer? I mean, you know, already know that, Mary. <laughs> so um, we know that when teaching students in schools, that uh, we encourage them to come up with multiple ways of learning and knowing and many different ways of thinking creatively. And don't just go for the first idea. Sometimes when you're any of us who are on here who create art, we know that when we come up with a, a first idea, sometimes we go around a circle and then we end up coming back to a new view of the very place where you started or maybe one of your other ideas was actually better because you just pushed yourself that much more to come up with a new idea. So anyway, yes, I'm just uh, throwing that in just because yep. you asked me. That's great. Okay. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Kathy. Anyone else? Yeah, Fred. Uh, I wanted to share an example. Um, years ago, I was introducing parabolas and decided uh, in the very first lesson that what I would do is I drew a stick figure face called Fritz, and it had 10 parabolas making the face up. I then gave them six of the formulas for those faces and said, what are the missing four formulas? And then at the very bottom, I put down the extension question, and what would you do to improve Fritz's face um, 
diagram your equations and uh, draw a diagram showing your changes. It was the results that surprised me because many of the students came back the next day. Uh, first, they were in groups of four. They had graphing calculators. They could uh, employ everything uh, so that they actually did a third of the chapter in that one period of them just trying to discover the interrelationships instead of me telling them to them. And they were much deeper learned. But the next day they came back and there was ears and mustaches that I expected, uh, you know, beard, whatever. But some students change Fritz to Frida or to a French foreign legionnaire or change the nationality or um, there was a lot of different ones. Fu Manchu came out, for example. But one guy came back the next day on an overnight assignment with 65 parabolas drawing Albert Einstein's face. Now I said, Paul, why did you do that? Like it's a four mark homework assignment back in those days. I still was keeping scores and things like that. And he said, because it was fun. So I started to pat myself on the back and then paused. Hmm, maybe he's actually telling me many of my other overnight assignments were not fun and were not engaging. And so it was this open-endedness that actually taught me something about teaching. Yes, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. That's a great comment. I see some other hands up. Uh, Peter had his hand up. I did. Fred, that, that was fascinating. Here's where you lost me. And here's where school lost me. What's a parabola? Is that a rhetorical question or do you want a quick no, answer? No, it's a, it's a serious question. I know now. They're the curves, yes, yes. Yes, I know now, but that's where school lost me. In, in, in the use of terms that were being used constantly, which were very simple terms in retrospect, but at the time, the, the groundwork had not been laid in practical ways. Do you get what I'm yeah. saying here? And that's why I started the unit with the practical yeah. seeing the concreteness. Of right. The yeah. And, and the same thing happens in music. I was a music teacher first. And it dawned on me very quickly because although I did a degree in music, uh, mm -hmm. classical music, to this day, I cannot read music. So the language of music, the written language, was a mystery to me. And I almost gave it up. My point in saying this is that just because kids don't get the spoken word doesn't mean they're stupid. And so I think we have to be very, very careful about that, right? Well, I could just finish that up at, at the end of this unit on transforming uh, functions. Mm -hmm. Their final assessment was they had to design and draw a picture using equations. Huh. to control the domains and make wow. their art show up. And yeah. it actually gained students. Some of them spent an average, I think, six hours on their final exam of that unit. Yeah. And yeah. they said it was a lot of work, but we'd do it again. Brilliant. They far exceeded Magic. the, the uh, minimum requirements needed. Yes. I wanted yeah. at least 10 equations, and some of them did 244. Yeah. And uh, some of them animated it and it was just open wow. it. it was art space representations. And yeah, this was a yeah, math yeah. class where all of a sudden they were doing the math yes. rather than the math being done to them. And that's, I yeah. think, what music. Uh, I c can I use Royal Conservatory as an example? Will anyone be offended? Yeah, I will, but go on. <laughs> and, uh, I was driving two kids to SFU for a math camp and one of them was studying for a grade 10 music theory exam. And yeah. the other one, I knew it already passed it. So I mm. said, so how often do you guys play uh, for fun? He yeah. said, music isn't fun. No, that's and right. I went, what? I said, mm. no, I mean, how often do you just sit down at the keyboard no. and just make up a song? We're no. not trained in that. And I'm sort of going, but I can sit down at the piano without any training and realize two fingers together is an ugly sound. If I spread my fingers apart, I get a better sound. And I can play. I yeah. can explore. And they both said, we're not trained in that. Oscar Peterson, uh, one of his great quotes, and then I'm going to shut up. 
uh, he was asked what what set him up. This was many years ago. What set him apart? And the interviewer said, "Is it the amount you practice?" And he looked at the interviewer and said, "Practice? I never. We never practice. We play." Wow. And the, the play is the practice. It's interesting as well, Fred, that, um, and something, Peter, you think you brought up a couple of times um, in the last discussion was um, the memory of that experience now. I bet you we'd all be remembering all of that information in a way that we could recall it now, which mm. I cannot. Like uh, my experience of that learning is that it didn't, it doesn't stick, it doesn't stay because I don't have an experience with it. I don't have anything that has allowed me to, to grow or develop new ideas about it or how it reacts mm -hmm. to me. I've literally regurgitated it and passed or not passed and that was that. But the memory of that, right. you know, how we, how we actually retain it is we could recall it now in a much better way than mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are. <laughs> yeah. Um, other other people. Um, Any, um, I think Jessica. Oh, uh, Jessica, and then Robin. Um, Jess, you had something. Yeah, uh, it's interesting that we were talking about the um, the math and the art and all the different blurring of the curriculum. Uh, I had private messaged Alexis just a quick message about um, the idea of taking an arts based approach and combining more knowledge based subjects or more prescribed subjects and combining them with more performative subjects like arts, music, drama, and just blurring the boundaries a little bit more between the subjects in curriculum areas. Um, so I teach as a part time professor in the Faculty of Education, um, and one of the things I really reiterate to my students is the idea of even if you're not teaching drama you can still bring drama into every other faucet or if just if you're not teaching visual arts you can bring that into every other faucet across the curriculum so i think we need to move um, away from the mindset that there's different subject areas and start blurring and blending things so i think that we see more of a big picture and take more of a project-based approach as opposed to a uh, prescribed curriculum-based approach um, so i do find it interesting that in the 21st century that we still have um, specific subject areas as opposed to this blurring already naturally happening and it being more organic um, but i definitely i really um, strongly believe in, a, in an arts-based approach and alexis it's alluding to the exact same thing that you just said where it's going to to create meaning making it's going to stick uh, because you've had that experience you're able to think back and think oh well this is how i felt when i was doing this so this is how i engaged with this or this is how it met within my narrative it wasn't something that just came out of the blue or something that i just memorized for a test mm -hmm. that's great that's yeah excellent comment uh robin I'm going to jump right on to that uh, sentiment and say I, I do arts integration every day in classroom. Mm -hmm. I teach math through art and science and uh, literacy and you name it. And I, it's, um, teachers are hungry for this, um, this kind of support in their classroom. They need to see it modeled because we've all apprenticed in a system, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and we've been apprentices since we were five. And we have yet to see or really witness any other kind of system. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, doing arts-based approaches is, is great in the classroom, but I, I'd actually like to see it go further. I'd like to see schools flip the core subjects. I'd like the engagement specialists, that being the arts teachers, like art and music and drama and dance and the gym teachers and the tech ed teachers, all those teachers are the ones whose who students come in and do amazing work, not for marks, because no one's paying attention to those marks, come in and do this incredible work and express themselves and grow and learn. Um, those are the core subjects and the math teachers and the English teachers are the specialists. Mm -hmm. and they come in and they find ways to integrate that learning into what the kids are already passionate about. That's what I'd like to see. And uh, I think that, you know, the, sci the science is out there, the research is out there to back it up. There, there really isn't a whole lot of discussion about it anymore. It's, uh, it's really the, the biggest barriers are systemic. Exactly. The whole yep. systemic thing is so, so critical. I totally agree with you, Robin. That's a, an excellent comment. And I think that idea of flipping things and, and the arts becoming, you know, the vehicle, the things that we focus on would just be amazing to, to work in that kind of environment. So, yeah. um, John, John McLaughlin next. Hi. Um, it's curious to hear all the math, being a math person myself. And I think that uh, maybe we're starved for voices of creativity. Mm. But the um, when I think of, I just want to give a couple quick examples, and then uh, 
pose an uh, First of all, if we ask you what's four times four, a typical math question, there's a deadening of what the answer is. And so I like to flip things around and move from the whole to the parts and ask what's 16. And the answers can keep on coming. Just something very simple in the way we frame something. Mm -hmm. And the hands don't all go down, they can come back up. Back. Uh, I like the idea of not necessarily seeking a different answer, but seeking a different approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So asking for the approach, the answer is pretty clear or isn't too hard, but I want you to do it a way that's not natural for you. So yeah. I will tell a high school teacher that they're not allowed to use algebra. And suddenly it's a new experience. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And uh, the, another way in math that's interesting is the idea of changing the context. We know that the basic idea of a circle is something that everything's a fixed point distance from a center. But if we change it to a world like the taxi driver's world, it turns out that a circle becomes a square in taxi cab geometry. If you say I can drive three blocks, you'll find out you actually make a square rather than a circle. So the idea of just switching the context slightly enriches what we, it wakes us up differently. And if you really want different answers, you just start with something, in my opinion, you start with something really simple, like 543 times two is 1086. That uses eight different digits. Find me other multiplications that use all different digits, and you'll be surprised how engaged they are, even though the question in many ways is, I have no clue how many there are. Okay. But that, those are just some examples from mine, and I really like the idea of mixing in the drama and the other areas. And one of those for me would be the example of walking fractions. I introduce fractions through walking them, not through talking about common denominators, mm. but talking about the importance of where they meet. But those are just a few ideas from the math world. But I think that the crossing over of disciplines is always a really healthy thing. Yeah. Thank you, John. Fantastic. Um, we've got David next. Hi, I'm David here from Victoria, British Columbia. Um, I was thinking two things. One, to jump on what John said. Uh, first of all, I, I, I'm not sure that it's about, you know, that there's no right answer. I, I think it's about the, it is about the question that you ask. Um, I mean, the SpaceX thing that just went up, to get to the space station, they need a right answer. Um, if they just took any answers and applied them, those people are not going to end up where they want to go. Um, there may be a million answers to if they have to change course and so forth. But so I don't think there's necessarily something wrong with a right answer. Um, but the question you ask is what will open up that creativity and imagination. Yeah. And the second part I wanted to point out was I wanted to push back on um, the idea that um, the arts and so forth is the only place that creativity and imagination happen. Um, I think math and science, uh, PE, uh, physical education, games uh, are all involve creativity and imagination. Yeah. So I, I think it's a, a question of how do you get to um, finding the imaginative part or the creative part um, in, in imaginative education. You know, of course, we talk about what's the story here. And in, say, math, um, there are a zillion stories that you can talk about or turn uh, as John just talked about, you know, walking, um, walking yeah. fractions is a completely different way of engaging the body and engaging uh, emotion and, um, and context and experience. So you can bring in a whole bunch of other stuff. But even the story about what are fractions, when you start talking about that there were Greeks that couldn't stand anything that wasn't a whole number, um, or uh, that you, you can generate excitement and connection to a topic. Uh, I think that's the, the, the more important idea than whether we have the right answer or not. 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. So thank you very much, yeah. David. I think that you made it really some really valid points, and I and I totally agree that creativity is not something that's in the arts, and and, the, and I think that's been, you know, again, it's, it's part of what uh, Scenic is about, and the ACC, and all these this really kind of looking at creativity in a much broader um, way, um, and we really uh, want that to be the case. Um, um, the arts, of course, have been one of the areas that, you know, where everyone says, oh, that's where creativity happens, but it doesn't just happen there. It happens in everything and in, in many, many ways. And um, I think that crossing over and, and seeing that, that the possibilities is really, really important. So thank you for bringing that up. I, I, yeah, I, you know, thank that's you. great. Okay, we've got Claudia next and then we'll go over to Stan. Hello, thank you. This is Claudia I'm from Ottawa. I'm a community engaged artist. And, um, and maybe um, I can talk from my perspective as an artist using art to support uh, teachers through the curriculum, uh, through my workshops in the schools. And I'm also a community engaged muralist. So I work with communities painting murals. So in the two areas, I, I, I see and I use art to engage participants into a, into a, into a topic. So I've been using art and um, the artists that I work with that are also community engaged artists. We are musicians, we are visual artists, we are we're working poetry and different kind of uh, disciplines. And we, our role is to, to bring to the classrooms our uh, workshops, our creativity, our uh, tools to bring kids through a specific topic. And I haven't seen a better way to engage these kids because they are, they are for example, uh, one of, the, of my, um, the artists that I work with, he's a musician and he brings empty tubes with different kind of colors to make music, to, make, uh, to, to find some notes. And, that, and then he's creating art, working with colors, working with sizes, working with physically the tubes, uh, working through <coughs> mathematics right? and, and in incorporating math and music and art and recycling all together. I create, uh, for example, mandalas in a certain technique which I uh, guide the kids through mathematics to and through geometry. Mm -hmm. And we talk about art and we talk about the meaning of mandalas all around the world. And when I do my murals, I talk about diversity and about uh, rights and about uh, all these kind of things that are so necessary for people to learn. And through the creation of the murals that are carrying those messages and working together with people. So I'm teaching them how to work with the brushes, what the paint is about, how we do, we're doing this and that, but we're talking about the main and the more important thing, which is the message of the mural. So I truly believe that the art is an incredible tool for that. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that remembering from when I was a little kid, the things that I remember and that I really truly learned were because my teacher was somebody who would smile or who would really be connected, not just with the topic, but with me or with the students. Yeah. So it's not just standing out there and talking, right? You, you need to have that connection, right? With the students. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. That's great. Um, great. We'll uh, head over to Stan. Just before you start, Stan, I just want to say there's a couple of people who are don't have their videos on. If I'm missing you or if you want to uh, uh, raise a hand, there is a raise a hand option in the chat. Um, uh, if you head down to participants, you can see how to do that. But also just type your name in. You can message me privately as well. Just want to make sure everybody feels like they've got a chance. Uh, so over to you, Stan. Um, so I grew up at a time where where we did a lot of rote learning and Mary Mary really said it. the school system back in the day was created to create workers right so I did the Mr. Muggs books when I was in grade one we did a lot of the phonics workbooks which quickly disappeared shortly after I kind of moved through that we did penmanship and everything that we did in school was very timetabled even in elementary school right like you, you didn't kind of veer from that two years after me, my sister's two years younger than me, the system had already started to change, but so much of where I was stayed locked in for generations. So as I looked at how my mother went to school and her mother before her, even, even way back, things hadn't changed, right? So grow up through that. So now as a parent, when my children come home with homework, I'm astounded 
as, as to what the questions are that they're asking. So somebody had mentioned that is that they've changed the question. So I go automatically looking for where's the black and white. There should be a right or a wrong answer. But the math questions are so much like if I open a math textbook, it is more reading than it is math because the idea is and as, and as it always was, was not just that you got to the answer, but how did you get there? Well, it's starting to spark that creativity. Well, my job, so I work in the education field as well, but I'm a custodial supervisor. So my job is to, is to manage the staff that clean across 25 different schools. Well, part of that too, I teach health and safety. I also teach um, the staff coming in how to actually do the job. Well because I come from that time where there's a lot of black and white learning, I've taken some time over the last couple of months, especially being part of uh, part of this, to take a look at how am I teaching? Well, a lot of how I teach is how I was taught, right? There is not a lot of deviation. I did not expect the staff to be creative in their own right because either something's clean or it's dirty, right? It's like that, that is kind of a black and white thing. So as I was examining what message I was trying to get across and uh, am I looking for their feedback, right? Because I know my job, I've been doing this for almost 30 years, but maybe how I do things just like our education system needs to change. So in the last few months since examining this, I've started to change how I'm, how I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm starting to ask them more questions. I'm looking at the information going, am I providing the answer right away or am I looking for their ability to give a solution to the problem? And I think that's where, as we talk about where the right answer is or what is the right answer, David said it, there are certain things where yes, it is a black and white, like especially in my job, certain things must be a mandatory, it has to be this, but I think in a lot of cases where we get used to that, and at 43 years old, I'm too young to be used to how things were yesterday when we're sitting on the cusp of so many different changes. And I look across the screen at many different generations of people here. It's fascinating that we're all trying to aim towards something that 15, 20 years ago was so foreign, right? Like, I mean, the right answer was simply that. But I think as we expand and open ourselves to new opportunities, that allows that thinking to go, not feed me the answer I have in front of me. Here's my question. Tell me what you believe the answer is, and let's see if we come to a common space on that. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Dan. Excellent remarks. Um, anyone else? We are sort of in the, our list, our growing list of people. Does anyone? Have, yeah, um, Nikki DeVito, if you don't mind <laughs> contributing. Um, good evening, all. Uh, my name is actually Michael Wilson, but that's a long story. Um, some of the challenges we've been talking about this evening relate to the changes we need to make from the industrial system of education towards something different, something more student-centered, something more human-centered. One of the problems with the industrial model is that it's it has stultified us all. As uh, Ken Robinson so eloquently describes, um, we start to lose our sense of ourselves uh, from about the time we're in grade one, and by the time we were in graduate school, we're all lost cases. And he teases us by suggesting that by the time we get to graduate school, we've only so concerned about our brains that we actually only need legs and arms uh, to get to the next meeting. So in order to suggest a way of making a transition, uh, it's to emphasize once again with older students, um, a reignition of their sense of play and their sense of playfulness. Um, and so um, I do a lot of work in um, the creative potential to be found in groups. And how do, we, how do we get groups to be able to work in an imaginative and creative way? And the first thing we have to do is reignite their sense of collective and individual playfulness uh, to be uh, not afraid to look idiotic in front of each other. And so I like to play with them a lot. Um, I sometimes get in trouble with university officials when I do that with uh, teacher education uh, candidates and even in graduate school. But I like to play with them so that they engage in silly activities or at least some would consider them silly, all of us, it would seem tonight, would find them quite serious. Uh, to engage them in 
in activities in which they laugh at themselves and each other at the same time. It has to be at the same time because only when they are not afraid to look ridiculous uh, to one another and therefore to, evade, uh, to avoid judgment um, of themselves by the others, only then can you have a collective group prepared to take the kinds of risks that we're all talking about here that students take and therefore to launch ourselves in the general direction to which this discussion so far tonight seems to be headed. Thank you, Michael, that's great. Yeah, that whole idea of how to get there. And, and I think we have been, uh, you know, we, we've seen, we don't value play in, in a sense, but, um, but we really are talking about that playing with possibility, playing with different ways of, of, of dealing with information and, and uh, using it in different ways. And perhaps that's the basis of it. Thank you. One of the things when Mary and I were talking about uh, this topic, because we were all, you know, we were deciding what to, to bring forward for a discussion point. And one of the things that I find that keeps coming up is this question of fear and how we have created, uh, maybe not creatively created, but um, there is a system in which uh, right versus wrong answer exists and so with the fear of getting it wrong we never attempt any other version of what right might even be able to be considered so the fear factor and knowing you know uh, neurologically the anxiety center of the brain harbors itself right beside the creative center of the brain so we have a lot of synapses that have to fire to get through the anxiety center to tap into the creative center and it's that sense of safety that's that place of uh, being able to take a risk but in in this right wrong answer we've also created this culture or we've sort of um, continued to use is it a pressure that the right versus wrong is that the wrong is the bad and the right is the good and so we have this mm. culture of fear that has imposed itself as well. Jillian, is that you? Alexis. Oh, it yeah. is. I, I can't put my hand. My hand is up in a car at a soccer field in BC, Go. but I guess nobody. Jillian, it's all you. Um, Your hand is up. Go. Oh. Um, Alexis, it was perfect timing for what I was going to say. Um, and, and that is around the, the fear that comes with the idea of right and wrong. So I think it'd be a lot of fun to ask students, what's the wrong answer here? And I think what you'd find out from that, plus the humor of playing with wrong answers, is sometimes a supposedly wrong answer may not be wrong at all. So we can play with the notion of right and wrong. And I just thought it fit in with what you said, um, because we can connect back to our first session and being playful about the way we approach anything and being playful about the ways we understand these words. Great, thank you. Yeah, great idea. <laughs> Um, Ray, uh, John, I think I've got John and then Peter. Did you have a, a hand up as well? Okay, I'll get John and then Peter. Hey, I just had a thought or a quick question. I'll take Mary as a colleague who's a creative teacher and people here are generally interested in moving education in a slightly different direction than we commonly see it. But would it actually be more creative for us to go into our classrooms and have to teach in a rote manner? rather than to do what we feel natural doing, which is more creative. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> I don't. <sighs> mm. uh, Peter, and then we'll have Natasha. Oh, you're just muted, Peter. Any response to John's comment? <laughs> to try. Um, I, I would like to hand to Natasha, please. Great, Natasha. Uh, just you're on mute there. Oh, I'm actually talking through Stan's computer. It's complex. Good. Excellent. Oh, tricky. That's tricky. I want my computer to do that. It's a, it's a shame you don't speak for Stan more often, but that's just a comment. Now, <laughs> while changing our names. I couldn't resist. Sorry. Okay. Um, so sort of to comment um, with what John was saying is that it's funny because um, so I'm an educational assistant and behavior is my thing apparently. 
And it's funny, some of the most behavioral classrooms I've been in, those students thrive on the rote, right? They thrive on those pencil paper fill in the blanks. So I think part of the creativity is exactly that, looking at what, what, what's actually the best way to meet these, well, in kids or whoever, where they are. And it may need to be more creatively, more concrete, or, you know, again, going back to some of those old things, because those old things are new now. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. So how would that, what would that look like in the classroom? I'm just trying to imagine that. It's, uh, it can be pretty tricky because kids also want everything to look the same. So it, it takes some creativity. Yeah. And where that can, and where that conditioning begins and how early that begins as well. And that's where, again, the loss of, and not, a, a, a absolutely, David, as you said, it's not just the arts and arts discipline specifically that invite creativity, but the loss of that early learning of arts disciplines where we get to be in that environment at an early age, engaging in these multiple forms. I think that we're really seeing the pressure of that conforming and the need to conform, which especially as you go through those age changes, you only ever want to conform form and it gets worse and worse till finally at the end we're here as adults saying if I asked you to dance if I asked you to sing if I asked you to you know public speak the answer is no 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 I don't I don't I don't I can't I can't I can't right um anyone else yes Ming you hi uh, hi Good Ming you. you hi <laughs> yeah I have a short <laughs> Sure. Uh, um, I think sometimes it's about our patients. I mean, adults' patients. Can we wait? Can we wait for students to think, mm -hmm. to digest, to create, or we just want them to learn fast, to do the things effectively? So it's sometimes it it's it's us. It's us to like to eager to give them the correct answer mm -hmm. so we must be patient mm -hmm. yeah that's a really interesting point that's the yeah that what part do we play in that that's a really good point thank you um uh, it's coming up on our 10 minute two mark everybody so uh jane yes please i, I just wanted to think out loud briefly about those moments when we're in a group with the group and the entire group comes to some sense of something at the same time <laughs> that that there may have been improvisation or exploration or there may have been discussion or brainstorming or body storming whatever was going on but there seems to be a i don't know that is that the right term a hive mind all of a sudden everybody focus on, on one thought or or one solution and so it, it makes me think about that it is the solution it's the one thing it's the answer but it wasn't predictable it wasn't linear it was all over the place and I wondered how that could go all wrong and I guess I'm thinking in the context of watching the American election and the different groups who are thinking different ways. So we can feel together absolutely like we're right. <laughs> and it wasn't the right answer we were given. But sometimes maybe those feelings are that we're, there is the wrong answer too. There is a consensus of, a consensus of misinformation, a consensus of, mm -hmm an emotional base to that, a consensus of this is uh, the right way to go, which takes us back to the one right answer did that, but it was given to us, but maybe we ourselves can sometimes collectively come to mm -hmm. an answer that is not right or we thought was right. So this whole, yeah. when we were, people were talking about what's right, what's wrong, mm -hmm. that just all flowed in my mind. And I thought I'd end on a light note example, the opposite of thinking deeply maybe uh, with a grade nine 
class consisting of probably 24 boys and four girls and very energetic. I'd been working so hard to talk about how we didn't have to say everything out loud that we felt at any given time about another person in any given activity. And how could we think hard and find positive solutions or answers? And we were all standing in a circle and I suddenly realized, my goodness, somebody has just passed wind and it is incredibly foul. And I'm standing there thinking, what are these kids going to do? And wondering. And I thought to myself, I think I'll just take a gentle step backwards because it's really quite awful mm -hmm. and see what happens. And as I stepped backwards, the entire circle stepped backwards without planning, without forethought. I couldn't have choreographed it better, except for one poor soul who didn't step backwards and the answer was there for all of us so I think I'll just end on that note there was right there was a right answer for that one. <laughs> oh, that's great <laughs> thank you anyone else yeah it's a... uh, Pe Pandora and then Ian and and lovely I just wanted to maybe share, uh, I'm a, an artist educator and uh, artist in residence uh, in Ontario. Uh, I teach teachers and um, artists how to uh, structure what they do or uh, for teachers, uh, how to use the arts in their regular curriculum. And my mom's an artist uh, and she was just in an interview today. And as a potter, uh, creativity is all about um, the failures. And, and she was talking, uh, it was really striking in the interview to talk about how what goes into the kiln, uh, what comes out that doesn't necessarily come out at all. And that part of that whole um, creative process is, is the link to the cycle where the, the, the entire creative uh, process ends with death or ends with failure. And there's a connection uh, because I work, I actually have the, uh, the great opportunity to work full time in the, class, in the classroom with many, many teachers because I do um, uh, professional development with them in in class uh, one of the things that I'm seeing is you know oddly in this time of creativity being the big push there are more and more children who are like we like what was said uh, really going by rote and enjoying that and really thriving with it so much that so much so that when you have a classroom where you're you're teaching creativity from the blank page all the way through the process to the product that many of them are very destabilized and I sort of wonder that in our times also as much as we want to embrace creativity that there is um, a broken relationship with parents and children because of access and perhaps that control uh, uh, for kids uh, and impressing their parents and impressing teachers and this hierarchy based on merit and marks uh, is very stabilizing for them mm -hmm. and the, pro the entire creative process requires the biggest baseline is time and then relationship. And we just don't have that in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Even to now, uh, I've, been in, um, I've been working in the, the industry for 20 years now as an artist educator. I've watched the places change. We've gone from a Monday to Friday schedule to a day one to five schedule or trying to enter guests into the school is, is becoming impossible. And now with COVID, it's the ultimate, the ultimate denial of having any visitor whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So beyond arts is relationship and one of the key pieces you know we can talk about creativity but it really is the urgency of relationship that we need and yeah. time to spend because we are all creative it's just that we need the other in the room with us really good points thank you for bringing those things up Pandora. that's and lovely uh, we, we just have uh, five minutes and Anne has a comment and then um, Mary and I will wrap things up. <clears throat> so Anne, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that this is absolutely fascinating and thank you for coordinating this evening for us. And I also wanted to say that so many of the comments tonight seem to be about the changes we want to see. But and getting overwhelmed with how big that task is. But I think if we start small and I'm 
I teach at the Faculty of Education and teach arts-based learning and did teach at high school. And I'm reminded very much of a very insecure, frightened grade 10 English class I had who were afraid of doing anything and were quite sure that they were in my class to fail because that was the attitude and the sort of psychological assignment that this school had given them that they were not going to do well. And so I was really working against that a lot, but I gave them really weird tests, wrote tests, you know, sort of like true and false, right and wrong, um, fill in the blanks. And then uh, as the papers continued on their test, the, the thinking required for some of the, and the problem solving required for some of the paragraph answers um, was much better because they had the confidence from the early pages, which they knew they got right, and they recognized the answers, to take a little bit of more risk and have their brains primed to think, well, I've done that well, so I can do this too. And I think that's something we need to bring to the whole field. We need to make people feel confident so that they're willing to push the door open and try something. We need to uh, reward their success for where they are now because we can only ever teach people from where they are and to invite them into a space that seems safe and not make the space unsafe, but to shift the space just a little bit each day or each way because they learn to trust us. And somebody wrote about the teacher taking the risk first, and I totally endorse that. So I think it's possible, but I think if we make a massive assignment for ourselves, we'll fail. But if we start to inch forward little by little, and each person does something, I think we'll see major shifts happen in the way that we want and need them to. And those other teachers and people that are skeptical about what we have, they've got time to absorb the change and observe the positive changes that are happening in the learners and then to come aboard as skeptically as they will in the first place. But as we know, then, then have that conversion into an arts advocate. Um, I'm thinking particularly of a friend of mine who was a phys ed teacher, took a drama course and then recertified to teach drama. So, you know, it happens and I think we can happen, but I think we have to take baby steps for everybody's sake and build and it will gain traction and go faster, but we don't have to like be overwhelming for ourselves to begin with. Those are my two cents. Thank, Thank you. you. Excellent. That's, moment. Excellent moment. That's great. Moment. Anne. Yeah, um, really good. Mary, do you want to um, wrap a little bit of things up and then I'll close us uh, up? Yes, we're almost, in fact, we're at nine o'clock. I just wanted to thank everyone for sharing this evening. And uh, this is just the kind of open-ended discussions that we're promoting where we, we present an idea or a concept and people jump in and, and share their, their experiences of things, their, con their, their perceptions of that. Um, I think tonight was really, uh, really fascinating because um, the whole notion of a right answer or a wrong answer, there are many different ways of looking at that. And uh, we've all been through the education system. We know what it means, but we also know that in many of our courses, we're challenging that to a certain degree, but also accepting the other. So it's a, it's a balancing act. There's no, again, there's no right or wrong answer. But I did say initially that it's about sometimes what questions we ask. So I think that I would kind of leave it with that. And I, I don't know, Peter, you were, you had, did, you, did someone else have their hand up? They wanted to make a comment or uh, that was, but, uh, no, okay, great. I'd like to thank everyone. And, and we'll be, um, uh, Alexis, I think you know the time for the next, the next event. Yep, so uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, as I said, this has been recorded. We are recording the chat. We will we'll post this on our website. We will post the link to the chat uh, as a live PDF. Um, we are trying to grow and expand our Canadian network of imagination and creativity. Uh, where you are right now, my uh, scenic uh, colleagues, can you all just give a wave? And I'll, I guess I'll wave for Jillian. I'll wave two hands, uh, just so that everyone knows who we are um, that this is the steering committee um, that is involved in scenic and so uh, we please pass on this uh, information about the network about these discussions uh, we're hoping as we do this this is our first foray and of course what we are hoping is that it, it builds and that we get some big accumulation and a national conversation happening um, so if you know anyone who might be a, a voice to contribute or just a listener who might be inspired 
inspired by this. Uh, this is the goal of this network is to continue to uh, reach out into different communities, groups, um, individuals, and just keep expanding this network and we, and we need your help to do that. Um, so next uh, month, uh, Jillian Jetson is going to bring us uh, the scope and power of story. So that will be on December 17th. We will send out our reminders a few weeks beforehand. And if you're on our email list, you are there now. And uh, if you have any other ideas, questions, or uh, thoughts, please do uh, stay in touch. And uh, we will definitely see you next month, hopefully. So thank you. And thank you to Mary and everyone for contributing mm. so thanks so much that was awesome thank you wonderful thank you have a great evening stay safe everybody